This is the Open University. <laughs> Hey guys, it's the uh, David Bowie of the Art Pop Underground with you again today, uh, as certified by the Guardian newspaper. And um, it's about a month since I've finished recording my album um, Crambambuli, or Crambambuli. I think I prefer Crambambuli, because it sounds like Crambambuli, kind of a thing. But um, so it was, uh, I think, July the 15th when I was recording the um, final song Pelican and since then I've been honing the record, shaping it, trying to decide what kind of music I want it to be, what kind of impression I want it to leave and uh, so I've thrown away some of the more irritating novelty songs, the ones with the Vocaloid um, vocals have gone. Um, I integrated uh, perhaps rather naughtily, rather at, sort of non-temporarily, I integrated a track uh, the Beast from 2016, because it didn't fit on Scobberlotches, which was a kind of angry anti-Brexit album. Uh, and I th- it kind of doesn't also fit on this Grand Bambouli album, but I think it's um, uh, a welcome relief, a comic relief in a record which otherwise would have been all about the miseries of the Ukraine war and uh, uh, existential dilemmas and things like that. So. Um, that's now on there, and also because it got 160k views on YouTube, so you can't really argue with that. It's a, a, a people pleaser. Uh, pretty uh, phenomenal viewing stats on YouTube for one of my tracks. I think because people are Googling the movie, the Borovitz movie it's about, um, from 1975. But. Um, when you're making the cover for an album, as I've been doing more recently, you have to think also about what the overall shape and feel texture of it is. And uh, that, I always find that interesting because I'm really a, a graphic designer, Monke. I, for re- economic reasons, really, I do most of the design myself. So this record, like many of my other records, will be pretty much not just sung, composed, recorded uh, by me. And it, there was one cover version. Uh, the Chuck uh, Senrick song that I discarded as well. But it will also be um, uh, visually designed by me. And that's um, one of the few chances I get to be the graphic designer that I was kind of wanted to be when I was a teenager. Uh, I was all ready to go to art school in London. I was going to go to the Central School of Art and Design, as it then was, to do graphic design. Uh, who knows where that would have taken me? It, if anywhere different, I don't know, perhaps I would have just ended up as the same Momus character. Um, or Momus, as uh, Stuart McCurney pronounces it um, on his uh, Radio 6 Freak Sound show. More popularly known as Momus, after the Greek god of mockery. And uh, so, I just, I like to give you uh, visual tours of the sort of inspiration. I was in Belgium, uh, in, in Brussels, I did a, an exchange, an apartment exchange, my place in Berlin for uh, a friend of mine who lives in Brussels, has a large um, uh, kind of artist's atelier up on the, the rooftops in the centre of Brussels, actually overlooking the art school there. And um, so I was there with uh, Noemi, my girlfriend from Paris, uh, for a week or so after recording, after finishing recording. And we went to the market uh, and uh, in Brussels, which is a pretty good flea market, quite similar to the one we're, we're uh, close to here in Paris, but uh, with more quirky, interesting things, because Brussels is a quirky, interesting city. And um, one of the things I saw there was this uh, um, game. It's like a kind of mixture between Scrabble and crosswords and... Um, I don't know, I haven't played the game, but I, I liked the um, kind of Edwardian display graphics that this had. And uh, it reminded me of New Jeans, because New Jeans influenced one of the um, tracks on the album, uh, Captivate. New Jeans being one of the biggest bands in the world just now, in case you hadn't heard, um, a girl band from South Korea, who are, you know, one of these packaged, uh, put together bands. But I find them creatively interesting. They're, they have pretentious enough videos for me to be interested with kind of movie stars making cameo performances, models appearing in them and um, a kind of uh, intriguing uh, cliffhanger kind of, um, not just the, the videos having this kind of uh, mysterious arty quality like you would get in 
real South Korean movies from people who want to win prizes at film festivals, for instance. But also the packaging is mysterious for me because I never quite know what's in these boxes. They release boxes which look like games, um, you know, board games and things, which contain download codes, which contain books, which contain, you know, all sorts of souvenirs and things. So it really is 360 degrees marketing. And I do kind of love the idea that Mama's records would be like... Uh, quite like that, that they would contain lots, because, you know, I'm a bit of a polymath. I could do a book uh, and release a book in my CD box, you know. If it's a big enough box, it can contain anything you want, and it would contain download codes and, uh, you know, maybe even compilations of Open University videos, and it could be a truly multimedia experience. But anyway, yeah, I saw the, you know, appropriately enough, uh, seeing these graphics, which they put in one of, uh, New Jeans put in one of their videos, uh, which had a kind of retro Edwardian quality, maybe somewhere in between Coca-Cola and Kellogg's cornflakes, you know, that kind of period of um, hand-drawn uh, lettering for products, where there was, a real, there was a lot of character, fancy decorative serif fonts, and uh, so I started investigating that and, and looked at uh, not just Kellogg's and Coke <laughs> and all that stuff, but also Pelican Inc., which is the German uh, ink making company who had very quirky hand drawn ink to in, presumably, uh, lettering for their products as well. And really, that, that was the beginning of my process. Could I do a sleeve that would say Cram Bambuli with these big. Uh, K's that look like the cornflakes, Kellogg's kind of K or whatever, a great big red K, a lot of imp impact, but a certain retro feeling. Uh, and I pursued that for quite a while and then, uh, but started thinking, what would I have for, a, would, I, would it be purely graphic? Would there be an illustration of some kind? And um, I went to an exhibition in uh, Nara actually, of a very, very good, very high-impact poster exhibition of this guy called Iko. Um, I'll put his full name here because I've forgotten his first name, but Iko, poster designs, um, very uh, 80s padded shoulder kind of take on Art Deco. So like a decade or so after the Edwardian kind of display graphics I'm talking about with Pelican, which are mostly 20s, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of um, Kellogg's Pelican dimensions, mostly 1920s. So then if you go a little bit further on, you get Art Deco and display fonts, which are much more blocky and um, tactile, geometric, uh, modernist. Uh, the Edwardian thing is not quite modernist yet. Um, so these modernist fonts, I guess they are from the 20s as well. Uh, and somebody, an Australian graphic designer, had done a special typeface based on the very pictogrammic, uh, pictographic designs of Eco. Uh, so then I started following that more using uh, this typeface as a, a basis for exploring um, and actually using Illustrator to, to get uh, the vectors of various typefaces and tug them around and change them, um, vectorizing. It was something I hadn't done before. I'd never really used Illustrator very much. Uh, but it's good for generating shapes as well. So I really started working on this uh, idea of having a lot of different shapes uh, which could be um, explored and tugged around. Weirdly enough it ended up looking a bit like Black Star, David Bowie's Black Star album because that's got the, the, the Bowie is almost illegible on that. Uh, Jonathan Barnbrook's work on that album. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize that the five symbols using star shapes uh, were s spelling out the name Bowie because they were so refined and graphically abstracted. So the Mamas um, now uh, that we get on the final design is quite similar to the, the Bowie <coughs> on Black Star. Not really a deliberate thing, but I did notice it as I was working. And I, you know, I never mind a Bowie comparison. <laughs> In fact, that's my favorite form of praise is when people say, wow, this could have been an outtake from Bowie's last album or something, which I get a lot, weirdly enough, uh, for my more recent work. Well, rather alarmingly, because of course Bowie <laughs> But we kicked the bucket soon after making, very soon after making that record. Uh, I'm still here for now. Um, on the Bowieometer, I've got uh, five years. Oh my God, I've got five years. That's all we've got. Six years. Because um, he just scraped 69, didn't he? And I'm 63. 
Life After 60, of course, is one of the, the outstanding tracks on this new album. Um, I hasten to add that Life After 60 is not a, a cabaret, a dismal cabaret, as it says. Uh, well, life's a cabaret in general, but uh, it's not a dismal cabaret being the age I am. I have a great time so far. But um, yeah, the um, the shapes I'm, I'm using uh, are also generated in preview, which is the simple... I mean, I tend to go for low-end and free software whenever possible, partly, if only because it doesn't lock you out or it doesn't, uh, you know, require a, a subscription and a monthly fee or, you know, security dongles and devices on various software that I've paid for in the past uh, has has ended up locking me out, not locking out unauthorized users, but locking me out of my own paid for software. I hate it. I really hate that. So um, I use uh, Preview a lot and Preview is very good for quick and dirty generation of shapes and lettering and ideas and things. So I went through, ran through quite a lot of Preview um, ideas and also using this iPad um, to draw uh, basic shapes with my finger, like potato paint, p- potato prints. Actually, talking of Bowie, that's something that when I was um, dating a smash hits journalist uh, in the 80s, <laughs> um, Bowie had apparently been annoyed by uh, uh, a joke in smash hits. Of course, they were all, it was all the kind of tongue in cheek humor they employed in their pop articles then. They wrote something about David Bowie's new uh, album cover being made with or coming free with potato prints that Bowie had made himself. Um, and apparently he didn't want to, uh, uh, after that, he didn't want to give them any interviews or anything. He, that, that burned the bridges with uh, Bowie because his art was very important to him. So I, I don't really have any visual art practice. I've had, you know, an art career of sorts, which was as a performance artist and as a storyteller in the gallery context. Uh, but uh, I secretly do want to, to do visual things and do love. I find it very absorbing to do visual things. So I spend a lot of time with my iPad doing kind of um, blobby fingerprint drawings, you know, uh, not fingerprint drawings, but, you know, uh, just scribbling with my finger and making shapes and filling them in. And so you can see some of that. One of those blobby shapes appeared on the front. People started saying it, um, yeah, it's the kind of round one on the front. And you can sort of see that it's been colored in by hand. So it has a, a slightly softer feeling. People said it looked a bit like a David Shrigley cover when it's just a blobby shape on its own with maybe a little funny lettering um, in Ariel or something. Uh, it didn't use the Shrigley handwritten font. That would be just a bit too Shrigley-esque. But people said this looks like a bean or a phallic bean come, you know, a bean bag <laughs> a cushion thing drawn by David Shrigley. So and you know that's not that's not the worst comparison. I, I I like David Trigley's work. I like especially when he goes into a kind of tongue-in-cheek modernist formalism where he just does successions of very simple shapes or pots or you know if you go to his exhibitions there'll be the kind of quirky cartoony stuff up on the walls but there will sometimes be sculptures and uh, uh, these se- sequences of um, quite formalist work where it's it reminds me of acute uh, formalism the label I came up with uh, about twenty years ago. Uh, to describe certain kind of uh, Japanese pop, the child disc label, and uh, where, where it sounds, it's very modernist, formalist, 20th century kind of uh, uncompromising, atonal or semitonal uh, music, but then it also has this, it sounds like children's songs, and it's got this innocent, cute quality, so cute formalism. So there is, a, I suppose you could say the, the cover of Crumbambuli has ended up being quite cute formalist in a way, but half generated with um, preview and half with, uh, with with the iPad. And well, that's more than two halves because there's <laughs> a th- one third generated with um, something else, which is, um, yeah, kind of art deco sensibility where I just juggled elements for quite a long time till I got, and, and colors as well, color balances. I didn't want to go too pink. At a certain point it was very pink, but of course the Barbie movie has made pink... Um, part of a marketing campaign this season so I didn't really want to participate in that so I actually toned down the pinks and things to to debarbify my cover make it more uh, pure an expression of a nostalgia for modernism there is a kind of parallel in the music because if you listen to the the theme music I use today for instance which is um, a little extract from uh, Pelican 
actually spelt the same way as the ink, so that's another connection with Pelican ink and that kind of graphic design. Um, you'll hear that it is it's quite bizarre and formalistic music. When you strip away the vocals, there is quite a bit of, um, you know, discord or interesting kind of modernist harmonies and, and, and also quirky world music instruments and things. Um, it's interesting that I, I do these explanations of my music and uh, I, I, wish I, I wish more artists did this. I, I follow Peter Gabriel, not that I'm a fan, I kind of hate Peter Gabriel's voice. Um, and uh, I've never really liked his music, um, although I, I like his pretentiousness, the, especially after he left Genesis and did the, um, the albums which are just called uh, Scratch or whatever they're called. Uh, uh, melt the melting face and all the rest of it it was a, a moment when i was a bowie fan at the end of the 70s when i thought should i get into this guy too because he's kind of pretentious too he's arty and uh, interesting using new technology like this digital sampling and stuff long before anyone else but i could i just could never get past his voice and also the structures of his songs i didn't really like um i suppose when he went more poppy in the 80s uh, a couple of tracks are, are, are more acceptable but anyway he does these videos where he talks about his um, talks pretentiously like I do well, I, I, I'm not really pretentious I think I'm pretty straightforward but he does talk about the, the thematics where he's coming from what he's inspired by he doesn't reveal the whole song though he tend to give you extracts from the song whereas I just splurge the thing out as soon as I've done it and uh, but also discuss it um, so <laughs> I don't know yeah the the album has a cover um, and what, what I ended up doing actually was uh, I found this uh, typeface called Giovanni which was quite similar to the Kellogg's um, Coke, Coca-Cola kind of look of the Edwardian enamel, tin enamel kind of period of uh, florid uh, just post Art Nouveau I suppose there was a lot of florid advertising signage that you still see in kind of theme bars and things because it's reassuring and comforting to people. So to combine that with the Art Deco of the front uh, was rather daring and, and rather strange. And I didn't know for a while whether I liked it, whether it worked, but I did end up going with it. So you have on the front, you've got this Art Deco shape-based purism. And then on the back, you've got a lot of florid kind of uh, vegetative type face uh, stuff going on where it looks as if the um, letters are climbing plants, uh, clematis or something climbing its way across the graphic space. And um, then there's a little nice little portrait of me on the CD. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And um, some of you have been asking about live gigs. I don't have any live dates um, planned just because I, I can't be asked at the moment. Um, but I think I will, I'll ease back into it somehow. I kind of like the idea of doing live performances in non-standard venues, partly because all the standard venues are going out of business right now. Also, we're seeing, uh, there's so many collapses of the world as we have known it, especially the music world as we have known it. I was just reading in the paper this morning about um, uh, the 1975 guy, Matt Healy, uh, being sued for... Um, um, doing a kiss on stage in um was it in indonesia and meanwhile um the uh italian prime minister personally suing um brian molko from uh, uh placebo for uh, calling her names on, on stage seems like it's really hard to be on stage now because of all the the rising oligarchy and people who aren't even oligarchs who act like oligarchs even within the eu um, suing you for uh, sort of fulfillment of my song Lawyers from the last album people being sued for just all sorts of ridiculous culture war gestures I mean the gestures themselves are not ridiculous it might be even essential on, on some level but um, it just seems to be a very difficult time to stand up and say and do things on a public stage because people are very touchy and also very vindictive so uh, they demand large sums of money for small gestures so at the moment, no live work planned. I, I think after this, I'll be going to Scotland for a while um, to see my mother and um, no other great um, voyages planned either. But the record is coming out on September the 15th and um, I'm in Paris for the time being. 
Uh, I love being in Paris. August is a funny time in Paris, though, because uh, half the uh, stuff you would like to do and go to and see is closed. Half the Parisians are in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival, including some members of my girlfriend's family right now. And they're loving Edinburgh, their first experience of Edinburgh. Um, the weather's been weird. It's been very rainy and cool. Uh, we're reading all about the um, wildfires and uh, record temperatures in other parts of the world, but Northern Europe has actually been unusually cool this summer. I think there's a kind of displacement of the jet stream or of the Gulf Stream or whatever it is that means that Europe is experiencing a rainy season for the first time. Uh, a regular rainy season, just like Japan has had, or parts of Asia have had for uh, centuries, which is that for six weeks in the summer it rains every single day and sometimes deluges. Even yesterday there was a deluge at one point. Otherwise quite sunny and, and pleasant and fresh days, but uh, there will at some point be a huge deluge and then all the umbrella sellers will be out there selling you umbrellas on the street and making money that way. So this is where I am, this is where it is. Uh, a visually oriented um, uh, talk today, and I hope the uh, the visuals are interesting. I always find it interesting when things are not quite defined, uh, and you're you're working towards getting a, a look or a, a feel or a sound, and um, that's really those formal decisions are also like form and content are not distinct. You know, form is a reflection of content. Content is a reflection of form. So uh, you find formally. A statement which is a content statement that's what i'll leave you with and thank you for paying attention and listening sorry these are a bit less frequent than they have been uh but uh yeah the um the uh, art pop underground is calling i better go into the bathroom and see what it's up to open university mm -hmm.